Hello and assalamu alaikum dear guests. I'm your host Dr. Akil Jaigada and welcome to another episode of Hello Doctor. A show that works to promote good health in the South Asian community and every week we choose a new topic. Today's topic is on cancer, sadly a condition that we all know about. Before I introduce our expert guests, it's important that um, you know that we have a disclaimer which is if, you if you're suffering from a medical condition or any other conditions that you think needs immediate care, please call 999-111 or attend your nearest A&E service. Without further ado, let's introduce our guest, Dr. Bilal Aikach. Nice now, to meet you. <laughs> thank you. Dr. Aikach, you have so many accolades and experience under your belt. I'm just going to name a few of them. So Dr. Aikach, he studied medicine at King's College London. After qualifying, he trained at Kent with a, with a focus on medical specialities. Uh, during his initial years as a doctor, he was awarded the South Thames Award for Clinical Excellence. He then completed medical training in London and guys in St. Thomas's Hospital, where he accomplished his membership exams at the Royal College of Physicians. After spending time as a med medical registrar, he now trains as a clinical oncologist, specialising in both radiotherapy and systemic cancer treatments. In addition to this, he has undertaken projects to help break down barriers in the NHS and BAME communities. Dr. Akash, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be, uh, for you to be here. Um, so today's topic is on cancer, and yes. sadly it's a condition that so many of us know about. Yeah. Either people have been personally affected <coughs> by it, their loved ones being affected by it, or people who they just know um, have been affected by it. Just moments ago, we found out that one of the staff, unfortunately, his, his sister passed away from such a yeah. terrible condition. And I thought today's topic should be on cancer because for some reason, the amount of cancer rates is going up, and hopefully we can discuss this later today. Sure. But first of all, let's start with the basics. What is cancer, Doctor? Right. So to get into this, I want to speak in a scientific term, as well as sort of what we call our day-to-day -day language. Reason being, in case any of our viewers are coming across cancer specialists and they hear these terminologies, they then can actually put the pieces together and understand what is actually being mentioned. So the scientific or the medical definition of cancer is the uncontrolled proliferation of abnormal cells within the body. So that sounds very complicated, but I'll give an analogy to help us understand what this actually means in our day-to-day -day terms. So imagine we had a phone factory, like the iPhone factory, and its day-to-day -day purpose was to produce mobile phones, the iPhone or the latest one, for example. This factory has mechanisms when the phone's being produced, that is producing the same phone every single time and it's performing its functions and it has its structures. But let's say there was a, a problem in the production line. For example, there was an iPhone that was missing its screen. There was an iPhone that had no battery. There are safety mechanisms and checks within the factory to make sure that if a phone reaches at the end of production, it's taken back and fixed. And if it can't be fixed, then it is destroyed. And so if we imagine now the iPhone factory being like, for example, your liver, it makes its cells, it performs its function. But within cancer, the ability to check that these cells are being made properly, the ability to fix is also um, impaired. And what happens is these broken cells, these non-functioning cells begin to sort of flood the market, you could say. Mm -hmm. And so they grow, they multiply, they expand, and now you have more non-functioning liver cells in comparison to functioning liver cells. Mm -hmm. And what the cancer is, is the uncontrolled growth of these abnormal cells, the organ's ability to lose its function as a result of this, and sometimes the spread of this mechanism in other parts of the body. What a beautiful, simple explanation of what cancer is. I know cancer, because it's thrown around so many times, but what it actually means, the crux of it, is very hard to describe, but bringing it back to something as simple as the iPhone and explaining yeah. that it's a safety check that is being taken away from the body, and yeah. therefore that unusual iPhone or cell is proliferating, is expanding, and it's taking over the body. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. Um, just going to go back to the viewers. If you have any questions regarding to cancer, the number is on the, on the main screen. Please call the, the studio and ask your questions. We have an expert uh, in the field with us today. So if you have any questions regarding cancer and the treatment and management, uh, please do call into the show. Going back to Tai Catch. Yes. So 
In cancer, you hear many times benign and malignant. Yeah. What is the difference? So what we do, for example, I'll talk about a patient journey at this point. And so a patient comes with what we call symptoms of cancer, and then they are investigated as such. So for example, if I had alternating bowel habits between diarrhea and constipation with some uh, weight loss, as well as being anemic, having a low blood count on my blood test, I'll be investigated. Um, well, what does anemia mean? Sorry. Anemia means low blood count. Okay. Yeah, and this is found on, can be found on blood tests organized by the GP. Okay. And so once, a, uh, uh, and then I get sent for investigations to look for a cancer. Mm -hmm. And the symptoms that I've uh, been describing, will be looking for bowel cancer. So in the lower part of the gut. Mm -hmm. And so if they find it, the first question that we want to ask in terms of investigations in this process is, does this tumor or this growth of cells have the ability to spread to other parts of the body? Or is it something that's focused and remains here? Mm -hmm. And that's the first question because that sort of determines what we're going to do. And so benign, refers to the cancer or the tumour being focused in one area only, typically in most cases being very slow growing, mm -hmm. or what we call malignant or cancerous, which is what most people pass away from when they, when they receive this diagnosis, is the ability for this cancer to grow very fast and to spread to other areas of the body. So is a benign tumour cancer? So. In layman terms, people call it yes, mm -hmm. but in terms of, you know, the red flags and, you know, what sparks off mm -hmm. the, all the concerns, mm -hmm. then we say, no, it's not cancerous per okay. se, but okay. it's just a growth of abnormal cells yeah. that is limited to that area only. Okay, that, that makes sense then. So we know what benign is, it's a, almost a localised yes. mistake of cells in one area, yes. but malignant means when it is <coughs> able to travel in different parts of the body, yeah. and unfortunately that's the condition that a lot of people die from when they have yeah. cancer. Okay, that makes sense. So what's the staging about? Staging. Okay, so to go back to the journey of the patient yeah. is now we've performed a CT scan, we've performed specialist investigations such as endoscopy, the camera down the throat, mm -hmm. and colonoscopy, which is a camera test from the back passage, mm -hmm. to visualise, to sample the cells from the actual cancer itself. And then specialists sit together in a meeting to discuss the patient, the case, and what we found. And we call this the multiple disciplinary team meeting. So you have cancer specialists, you have medical specialists from that organ type, you have surgeons, you have the cancer nurses and the coordinators to make this all happen and to document all, mm. the, all the important findings that we have. And what we say is what is the TNM staging? The, so the tumour type, how far it's spread locally and has it spread anywhere else in the body? And depending on what the results are in that staging criteria affects the management that we give. Okay, that makes sense. So there's stage one and it can go up to stage four or above. And yeah. Is stage one good or stage so four good? So what we say, yeah. the, the methodology of diagnosis of cancer and what the whole NHS is geared towards is, some, is basically early detection of cancer. Mm -hmm. Because if it's smaller when you find it, if it's not spread anywhere, there is more that you can do about it. Mm -hmm. And within the NHS, we've got something called a two-week wait referral pathway. Okay. And this refers to any GP practice that a patient's registered at, and also at the front door of A&E, or even within the hospital when they're an inpatient and they've been treated for one problem, but there are concerns about cancer. And what this means, that because of this time-sensitive issue of trying to find cancer as early as possible to give the best chance of successful treatment, we say that if anybody has concerns or the symptoms concerning of cancer, that there has to be a referral within the first two weeks of that detection of symptoms to a specialist who can plan investigations to look for the cancer or provide reassurance that it's not cancer. That makes a lot of sense. I think in that sense, the NHS is such a brilliant service where yes. you might be going in for one thing to the, the hospital yeah. and you have signs of maybe cancer, and there's a referral yeah. process as fast as two weeks for you to get the ball rolling almost. Yeah. yeah, and what's beautiful is that, you know, for example, we see in the NHS there are long waiting times in A&E, mm. long waiting times for routine operations to take place. But every clinic has reservations for query cancer slots. Yeah. Okay. So these are dedicated appointments for patients specifically 
who have query symptoms of cancer. For the oncology department? Uh, within the general departments for the investigations of cancer. Oh, interesting. I yeah. didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. from an oncology perspective, yeah. we don't, um, we're not really involved in the diagnosis of cancer. But once the diagnosis is made, we are involved in the pathway from then on in terms of the management and the treatment. Interesting. So oncology just means cancer. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's quite um, a needed feel. Uh, yes. Unfortunately, I know personally a lot of people who have suffered from cancer. I know a lot of people who passed away from cancer. I'm sure you have as well. Yeah. We know a lot of relatives of people who, when they hear the C word, it's, it's all fear, alarm bells. Yeah. Um, and being in such a profession is such a noble profession inside medicine to be in. Thank you. I would love to know, why did you choose it? I know apart from yeah. the obvious, but why did you go into this field? So, to be completely honest, um, my decision to specialise in cancer work or oncology was quite a late decision in my career. When I finished medical school, I was quite undecided about what I wanted to do. I found pretty much everything interesting. And with the training pathway being very competitive and, um, and, and sort of difficult to get your foot into the profession, I had to spend time debilitating about really um, what I really wanted uh, to do. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, sort of um, thought about GP for a little while. I thought about working in A&E and I really liked medicine as, uh, you know, as I went through a lot of medical training and I thought about geriatrics, uh, elderly care medicine. But what really sort of um, sold the deal, you could say, um, was working with cancer patients as part of my medical training. I got uh, an oncology rotation at the Guy's Cancer Centre. Um, cancer patients are truly vulnerable because they, everybody's living a normal life mm. and then all of a sudden they receive the cancer diagnosis and all their priorities have changed. Yeah. Everybody has been living towards, you know, working towards getting a good salary, having a family, working towards retirement, providing a good life for their children. And all of a sudden the cancer diagnosis has put that to a halt. Mm -hmm. And so you find that no matter what age group they're in, whether, or even whether they're male or female, you know, everybody, but the, the cancer diagnosis becomes the sole focal point of their life. Yeah. And for me, working as a doctor, to be that person who either provides a cure for their cancer, or provides a dignified way of passing away mm -hmm. within, with, due to their diagnosis being uh, untreatable. I find it a very honourable um, profession in that way, yeah. and also something worth as worth me actually, you know, working day and night towards this. Oh, it's, it's a beautiful profession. Actually, what happened? I'm currently looking after that cancer patient who unexpectedly had cancer. It's a very yeah. young uh, gentleman, about in his yeah. 50s. He came in because some of his legs, the power in his legs weren't working as well. Yeah. They thought it might be something else, you know, something vitamins or minerals or neuropathy, uh, neuropathy that's causing it. Yeah. Did an MRI scan and he has grade four gl glioblastoma, which is, as we know, um, not the best type of cancer in terms of treatment. Um, yeah. To the audience, what that basically means is brain cancer. And it's at all the way from grade four, so it's very severe brain cancer. And seeing this patient in his mid fifties, I spoke with him and I speak very frankly with him. He's a, he's a lovely person, a lovely gentleman. And he said to me, he said, Akil, before this, I had all these worries. Right now, the only worry I have is about this. Yeah. And he went to his oncologist. Yeah, they gave him about 10 to 15 months prognosis. And he needs to start radiotherapy almost immediately. By the way, the service from the oncology department of getting that CT, MRI scan, moving through these different steps was absolutely phenomenal. Like it was yeah. as fast as a click almost. And he then was put on a clinical trial drug. We'll discuss more about clinical trials, but the idea was just a few more months if he can get with his family, that means the world. And it's yeah. that mindset. And I'm sure you yeah. see it time and time again. Yeah. And that's another reason why I was really convinced um, to be within the field of oncology working with clinicians, of them actually being my colleagues, and you could say my work family. And these are people who actually take everything into consideration um, to just try and look after the patients. You know, when we look in the general hospitals, mm -hmm. on the general medicine and surgery, they tend to be very busy because of the workload. And as a result, don't really have the time to put in this level of focus and care for their patients, where social aspects actually mean a lot. Yeah. 
um, you know, a very interesting case that I had come across um, in person myself was a patient who had a tumour in his neck. He was pretty young, he was in his 40s. And, you know, the, the tumour itself was deemed incurable because it was actually invading one of the major arteries in his neck. Mm -hmm. um, and the risk to death was actually significant because if that artery bled, he would die within seconds, basically. Oh, really? And so he couldn't go home. Yeah. And so he was in hospital and he said to us, you know, as, as, as a team of uh, doctors that I would really like to marry my partner before I die. And so what we actually organized was a priest to come into the hospital. We put him in, in his, uh, and his partner into a side room. Mm -hmm. And all of us were actually witnesses to a wedding before he passed away a few days later. Okay. Whereas, you know, um, whereas in the hospital in general medicine, they don't have the time or the ability to engage in this level of detail with their yeah. patients. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for me, I find that even though his tumour or his cancer was incurable, mm -hmm. we managed to bring honour and some level of satisfaction to his life before he passed away. Fabulous. I think it's stuff like that. It just really, I know you have a lot of lows as a doctor, but when you see yeah. something like that, it just refreshes Definitely. everything and makes everything worthwhile. Definitely. Um, this is another thing about the NHS that I love is because we hear a lot of negative press about the NHS. And one of the points of today's show is to make sure people understand how fantastic the NHS is. I yeah. know we saw it do during COVID, but COVID isn't the only condition. As you've seen cancer, you went above and beyond that role. To make, yeah. And the team went above and beyond that role to make sure that this person you're treating is not just treating the condition, but you're treating it as holistically as possible. Yeah. And socially impor important is such an important thing. Yeah. Let's go back to cancer, uh, be it. Is cancer, oh sorry, let's take it even one more step back than that. That's fine. What are some of the red flags that we should note, that if we are noticing in ourselves or in our family, our loved yeah. ones, that could be indicative of cancer? So... What I would say in this is that this is a very broad subject, which does mm. require a lot of detail, mm -hmm. but I'll try my best to cover as quickly and, uh, as possible. Mm -hmm. And the symptoms of cancer really tend to depend where we think the cancer is actually originating from within the body. So, for example, if someone, we're thinking about brain cancer, we're thinking about signs and symptoms of raised pressure in the head, as well as an acute change in personality with no unexplained cause. So for example, I've known you from university mm. and I know how you are in terms of your personality, relaxed, you know, and hardworking mm. at the same time. <laughs> um, but then for example, if I find that your personality has completely switched and you haven't been started on any medication which can cause personality changes, you haven't got any infections which can sometimes make you confused and all your blood tests tend to be relatively normal. At that point, I need to think actually do I need to scan your, your brain to see if there's any tumours inside? Because sometimes the pressure from the tumour itself can cause changes in personality. Oh, interesting, yeah. For, for example, lung cancers or cancers in the throat, mm. we think about an acute change in voice um, and you know, an, an unexplained cough which is persisting for months, you could say. For stomach cancers, you know, or um, sort of lower gut cancers, you're thinking about you know, alternating bowel habits with no, unexplained, uh, with no explained cause, and also weight loss and anemia, as we were mentioning before. Yeah. For your blood type of cancers, you think about weight loss and night sweats. Mm -hmm. And also, by and large, the most indicative factor is also family history. Yeah. So if they're, for example, a brother or your sister or your mother, father, and for generations, we're thinking we can see cancer that's been running in the family. If you present with similar symptoms to what they have had, it makes us more concerned that actually you may have cancer yourself. Okay, interesting. So we talk, we spoke about what cause, what can possibly cause cancer. So if you have a family history of cancer, yeah, you possibly have the gene, or in your DNA, there's a defect of some sort yeah. that can make you more predominant to to having yeah. Yeah. Cancer, is that correct? Yeah, so what I would probably say in terms of gene or DNA, mm -hmm. to break it down, it's the coding which makes you you. Mm -hmm. So for example, to bring it in as another analogy, if you have a car, if it's made in a certain way, if it's made very you know, strongly and efficiently, the ability for it to break down, the ability for its car parts to always stay functioning should always be high. But if the car is manufactured at a dodgy factory, mm -hmm. then its ability for the car parts to break down is a lot higher. Oh. And so if you know where the car came from, 
then you know it's risk of, of breaking down. And so likewise, if a family member or a family for generations have had risk of can have had incidences of cancer, mm. then we know the risk is higher in that person. Yeah. Again, I love your analogies, and I think the sign of a good doctor is a being able to break down complex conditions into very simple terms, so the patient understands them. Thank you. You clearly have that, Doctor. I can't. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we spoke about the family history side of cancer. Yeah. What are some of the environmental factors that can cause cancer? Yeah. So. What we call cancer is something called multifactorial, mm -hmm. which means that there are many different things that cause cancer, and it's never just one thing on its own. Mm -hmm. yeah? And so the encouragement from here is for people to be as healthy as possible, because we find, for example, apart from just family history, we have smoking, which you know, in our elderly generation, mm -hmm. because the risks of smoking was not known at that point in time, many took up smoking and have mm -hmm. found it hard to quit. And so smoking, can cause many different types of cancers, but the most important one and significant one is lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Being overweight and severely overweight for a very long time increases risk of cancers, including breast cancer. Yeah. And also then environmental in terms of, you know, how healthy the person is. And, you know, for example, eating a lot of processed foods can also increase the risk of cancers. So it's generally speaking, my message to the, to, to the people watching would be just to be as healthy as you can in by and large, that should be some form of preventative uh, factors for cancer. Yeah. However, because it's all multifactorial, then it, it's never a hundred percent. Of course. So smoking, being overweight. Yeah. Um, I think people who also sit in the sun all day. Yes. That can increase your chances. Sitting in the sun yeah. without any sort of sun protection cream yeah. or anything like that. So everyone, get your SPF 50s out because that can possibly stop yes. you from getting cancer. Yeah. Um, we spoke about the different types of cancer, but how does one, you know, go about in the NHS to make sure they can be screened for the cancers, uh, for different types of cancer? So different countries in the world mm -hmm. have different screening programs. Mm -hmm. And so what's the most important thing is to think about is that just because we don't have one type of screening in this country doesn't mean we're deficient or lacking in our screening programs. What it is actually is according to the data in our country, about what cancers are most in number and most common, then our screening programs are, are adjusted according to that. Mm -hmm. So for example, breast cancer is very common in the UK, but in Japan, it's stomach cancers because of different factors within the oh. country, so on and so mm. forth. So they have a gastric cancer or a stomach cancer screening program, but we have a breast cancer screening program. So the three main ones that we have in, under the NHS in the UK um, and this, by the way, why we, when we mention um, screening programs, is that these are screenings that happen automatically regardless of whether you have symptoms or not. The, the investigations for it are offered to patients. Okay, interesting. So yeah. regardless of if you have any symptoms or signs, it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. Everyone is given the service. Yeah, okay. they're at least offered it. And offered it's up it. to the patient whether they want to join onto the program or not. Yeah. So it's cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. So for uh, women, it's for a cancer of a part of their reproductive organs, mm -hmm. breast cancer, as well as bowel cancer. Okay. And so for um, cervical cancer, it's offered from the age of 25 um, and, and it's up to the age of uh, 64. So um, from uh, the age of 25 to 49, the screening program, which is a cervical smear test, is offered every three years and up up until that afterwards, after the age of 49, it's every five years. And the okay. reason is, is that because if they can catch it really early, they don't need to perform any operations. There mm -hmm. are smaller procedures that they can perform yeah. to actually eliminate the sort of the cancerous cells or pre-cancer cells is what they, uh, what, they, what they can see. So cells that aren't normal, aren't cancer, but has the ability to transform into cancer. Fine. And so um, it's offered at every GP practice. You have um, breast cancer screening programs from the age of 50 and up, um, and that can, and you know, um, they can see the GP for that and get plugged into the nearest hospital that has a breast cancer service in terms of ultrasounds and mammograms. Yeah. You then have bowel cancer um, uh, services for the more elderly gentlemen, and they offer a stool sample, which has you know quite high uh, ability to detect small amounts of blood. I admit that not every sort of speck of blood within the stool is cancer, but in the elderly population, it's more concerning. Okay. And so if someone has blood in their stool, 
it's more important that cancer is ruled out first before thinking about everything else. I think this is exactly why prevention is better than cure, and that's what, 100%. The, scre that's what the screening allows. Um, goodness me, we've spoken so much, and I haven't looked at my board once for any of the questions. We're just going, flowing, <laughs> asking, you know, having a conversation about cancer, and talking about, so far we spoke about what is cancer, what are the different types of cancers, the screening process of cancer, how you can stop yourself from possibly getting cancer. Yes. Um, we spoke so much in the first half. Unfortunately, we're just going to have to go for a very short break, but do come in because we have so many more questions to ask. And also, as, as always, if you have any questions and you want to call, this is a live show, so call on the number on the, on the main screen and we'll be happy to take, your, take your, any calls you have. Thank you.